and we are baptized to live together this life as Christians. But we, frankly, not unlike Peter's first century hearers, have a problem. Luther complained about those in his day who denied the power of baptism, saying they regard the water as dog's bath or cow's bath. In fact, Luther complained about them. They stare at baptism like a cow staring at a new barn door. You folks from New Jersey will have to take the Iowans' word for that one. And us, we might even be worse. We know and believe that baptism is not just plain water. We know that it works forgiveness of sins, rescues from death and the devil. We know all of that and think nothing of it. And how do I know we think nothing of it? In fact, you think nothing of it. Now, let me give you a warning here. I'm not going to preach about the law tonight. I'm not going to describe the law and how it should make you feel. I'm not going to talk about some people in general somewhere who aren't following the law. I'm not going to dole out the law in some innocuous dosage to irritate you so that you can leave this place even more smug than when you came in in your own holiness and look down your nose at the person next to you. I'm going to preach the law tonight to you to every single one of you. Repent is the message of the apostle. Repent. The path back to baptism is repentance. Peter preached in the very last verse just before our text, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And make no mistake, those first century Jews crucified Christ in your name, in your stead. When you fail to speak Christ and his forgiveness to others as you go about your daily vocation, it is not, is it not as though Christ were dead to them? Faith cometh by hearing. You cry out, I tell you, I don't know the man. When you chew up your pastor, or pastor after pastor, or wring the life out of a poor DCE and spit her out because you won't spring for a few more bucks to keep her on, you cry out, give us Barabbas! And I wonder if some of your congregations, if they had Jesus as the pastor, wouldn't have a voters assembly crying that very thing. Give us Barabbas! When you pastors can find any excuse not to be visiting your people and hitting the pavement in your community, being Jesus there, who came to seek and to save the lost, you render Jesus dead to that community. You cry out, crucify him. Do you not? When your church is embroiled in controversy and inside you cry out, crucify them you cry out, crucify him. When your hearts are filled with lust instead of an unquenchable thirst for God's word, you cry out, crucify him. When you are discontent and unhappy with your lot in life, unhappy with your call, impenitent with your congregation, even lording it over him, pastors, you take the crown of Christ and press it down, that thorny crown, press it down on his very head and say, hail, king of the Jews. Now, if you're sitting there thinking, man, I'm glad he's talking that way to my pastor. <laughs> then you're twice as damned as your pastor under the law. And when after the last voters meeting like Judas, you were hiding in the corner talking about how to crucify your pastor, you cried out, let his blood be on our hands. And when you fail to pray, the Lord of the harvest send workers. You fail to pray for your own pastor. Or pastors, you fail to pray for your people. You crucify the Lord 
of glory. Don't waste time denying your sins, Luther says. You crucified him. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? For I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Repent and be baptized. Wash me from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. My friends, Jesus Christ died for sinners. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. As much as it pains me to preach this, if you tonight are no sinner, if you do not recognize yourself in the scorching mirror of the law, if you are not a hard-boiled sinner just like the rest of us, then you might as well leave right now. Because Jesus is not for you. Jesus himself said, you see, I came not for the righteous who have no need to repent, but for sinners. Baptized sinners. Good night. Luther said about Jesus' own baptism, when Jesus is baptized, he sticks himself in the water so that when we go into the water of baptism, we pull Jesus out with us. How marvelous. When Jesus is baptized, Mark's gospel says, heaven is torn open. So Luther says, in heaven, in baptism, heaven is nothing but doors and windows. It's wide open, and it's in baptism. It's in the water. He's born of a woman, born under the law. He knew no sin. He sticks this perfect obedience in the water. It's in the water. In Jesus' baptism, the Holy Spirit descends as a dove. The Holy Spirit goes into the water. In Jesus' baptism, the voice of God from heaven says, Behold, you are my beloved Son. God the Father's words of approval go in the water. Paul says, In baptism we are buried with Christ into his death, so Christ's passion, the death sentence, the ridicule, the standing before Pilate, the beatings, the whippings, the bloody crown of thorns, the king of the Jews, the nails, the forgive them, Lord, they know not what they do, the today you will be with me in paradise, the it is finished, the last breath, all of it goes in the water. And Paul goes on. There's much, much more. For if we have been united with him in a death like his in the water, we shall surely be united with him in a resurrection like his in the water. We know that our old self was crucified with him in the water in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin in the water. For one who has died has been set free from sin by the water. For one who has died has been set free in the water. Now if we have died with Christ in the water, we believe that we will also live with him in the water. And Paul goes on in Titus. But when the goodness and loving kindness of our God appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Ghost in the water, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, in the water, so that being justified by grace in the water, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life in the water. It's all in the water. Don't you see it? Peter says baptism now saves you in the water, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as a pledge of a good conscience before God. You see, baptism is the pledge. The pledge goes in the water with Christ. Christ has stuck all of this and more into the water. And because you've been stuck into the water too, it's all yours, every bit of it. So let's go on about our business here, baptized. Doesn't mean we're always gonna agree on every strategy or resolution. We won't. Doesn't mean we won't have personality clashes and struggles and sins among us. We will. But it does mean this. 
Paul says, we were therefore buried together, soon etafe men, buried together, all of us together, into his death. Together we're in the water, sink or swim. And Peter goes on to preach, the promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So, when you want to scream this week and point at those around you and say, you're all wet! <laughs> well, yes, they are. And so are you. Now let's get about the business of getting the whole world wet. It's all in the water. We're baptized for this moment. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.